Okay, I think that uh, we might start. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm happy to welcome you all during the webinar Resources for History Teachers International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, today's webinar is organized by European Network Remembrance and Solidarity. And this is the webinar in the series. Uh, we already organized four such meetings, um, which have been recorded. Uh, and um, uh, at the end of the meeting, we'll share all the recordings from the last webinars with you. Uh, during today's uh, meeting, thanks to our Albanian partners, uh, we provide translation into Albanian. Uh, with Dina Lila, the translator. So if you want to choose Albanian, uh, you need to press the globe, uh, like the circle um, button on the bottom and switch to French, which is not very obvious. Unfortunately, Zoom gives us only the possibility of uh, of few languages and Albanian, it's not there. Uh, so that's the beauty, but you need to choose French if you want to listen the webinar in Albanian. Uh, my name is Ursula Biosh. Uh, I'm project coordinator of High Story Lessons website. Uh, I'm historian. I graduated with master's degree in history from University of Warsaw, um, but I'm educator as well. Um, I have been a content editor uh, of teaching resources, which we will present today. And together with me is Julia Maya. Uh, who teaches history and English uh, at the Bundesgymnasium and Bundesrealgymnasium Enns in Austria. Uh, and she's also the regional, regional coordinator in Upper Austria for Erinner at, uh, dat at uh, which develops educational materials about the Holocaust. And Julia, you will, um, I, will, uh, I will ask you to present yourself maybe uh, in, again in another part of the, of the webinar. Uh, and I will follow uh, with uh, with the introduction. Uh, and I welcome you all, teachers from across the Europe. There are more than seventy of us uh, today now. Um, your cameras and microphones are turned off because we're in the webinar mode. But I invite you to listen actively and to take part in the Q and A session, which will be held uh, at the end of our meeting. Uh, but if you've got any technical question, you can ask them to uh, Tatiana, who's our technical support uh, on chat. Um, this webinar will be recorded, uh, but without chat, so your uh, data or image won't be visible anywhere. Uh, our meeting will uh, last uh, one hour and 15 minutes, so we will finish at 6.15 p.m. And uh, after the webinar, I will send you a presentation uh, and all the links to the teaching resources we will speak about uh, today. Um, just to underline that this webinar is funded by the European Union, uh, that is open for, to everyone, no, 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 no matter nationality nor gender. Um, okay, and maybe let's switch to the goals of, the, of our webinar. There are three of them. Mm, firstly, I will speak a little bit about uh, the ENRS. Uh, I've seen on the list that there are a lot of people who already participated on uh, in the webinars, uh, but a lot of new uh, names as well. So I will just uh, speak a little bit about the organizer. Um, and during the meeting, uh, you will discover methods and sources which uh, help you to prepare a lesson about history of Holocaust. And then uh, I'll give uh, the floor to Julia and, um, and you will learn about good practices uh, in introducing the history of Holocaust into, into your classroom. Okay, just a few words about the ENRS. Uh, um, uh, this is a network of countries. Uh, network member, members include Poland, Germany, Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia. But we've got uh, advisory assemblies from, uh, from different countries as well, those who are marked on the map in blue. Um, and our uh, main goal um, is to develop uh, the European cultures of remembrance, not the one culture, but different European cultures. Um, but here on the map, you can see as well uh, another country. So the countries in which we've got partner institutions. So I hope you can find your uh, your country here, if not there on the last slide. 
Um, so maybe about a few words about uh, educational projects uh, we've got in ENRS. The first one I would, look to, I would like to speak about is Sound in the Silence. This is an uh, intercultural and international project, project where students from four different countries meet in one of the memory plays. When they meet, uh, they've got a workshop with artists and at the very end of the project they present a, um, an artist uh, event uh, to talk about their emotion related to this difficult history. Um, this project will uh, have uh, its two editions this year during uh, autumn in September and October um, and they, uh, it will take place in Jasenovac in Croatia and in Vanza near Berlin in Germany. Uh, so the, the applications will be open, we will let you know uh, when, when, when it will be possible to take part. And the second project, it's called After the Great War. This is the big outdoor exhibition who's traveling across Europe. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm speaking about it because there is a catalog, very interesting one, uh, which, is, uh, which goes together with the exhibition. So if you've got the lesson, lessons who speak, which speaks about uh, this period of time, so 1918 and 1923, you can use the catalog as a teaching resource as well. Uh, the third project, the, the big one, is European uh, Remembrance Symposium, which will take place in May uh, 2023 in Barcelona this year. So if you are more into, um, into museums, into, uh, if you're working as a as practice or, uh, or uh, as academic, uh, you can take part in, in the symposium as well. Uh, and the event we are now working on, this is the conference which will uh, which will took place in Berlin uh, in February. So the registration is open. So so there's st there's still possibility to to take part. Uh, okay, so now I will um, I will um, here you can see the the address of our website highstorylessons.eu. So this is the place where you can find uh, all the teaching resources we will speak about today. Uh, the main language of the website is English, but the website exists in six other uh, languages, uh, which are countries of the of the ENRS. And after uh, the webinar, you can enter the website switch to your language and uh, check uh, which teaching resources are available also uh, also in your language. Uh, I would like to show you the website itself. Um, so now, I'm, uh, now I've, I've chosen English version. Uh, and here, if you click on the menu, you can see uh, the main tab, it's resources for teachers. Um, and if you click on the resources for teacher, you can uh, you can see our our resources. Uh, and here, uh, I especially invite you to go to the uh, animation part uh, because it is a short, ready to use uh, way uh, to present difficult subjects uh, from uh, from political history, uh, from economical economic history, as as for example the Marshall Plan. Uh, then you can uh, find articles and scenarios and then also infographics um, which is which can be displayed uh, in in the classroom on the screen uh, for example as a presentation uh, after resources for teachers you can find a tab called resources about disinformation and uh, this is uh, a part which is especially up to days nowadays during the war in ukraine during the time of uh, uh, of fake news of social media and here you can find uh, short movies for example the first one how to win a memory war uh, which is like a which can be displayed in the classroom and then in the publication part noted as information this is a guide uh, for a teacher or for older students uh, and here students uh, can um, can find information how to spot fake news around them and here this is the main part which is called topics uh, because uh, here uh, with every topic goes um, uh, goes a lesson scenario 
tackling such questions as deepfake uh, or information bubbles or, for example, historical fallacies uh, in, the, uh, in the communist or Nazi regimes. Uh, so this is the second part of the website. Um, and uh, here uh, there's a timeline of the 20th century. Uh, here you can choose the country, which is most important, most interesting to you uh, in, in the very moment. Uh, so, for example, I've chosen Romania. Uh, and then choose um, an event. Uh, and if you click on the description, you will get a short PDF file, which can be printed uh, and, uh, and given to the students themselves. There is a place for notes, so it might be also something which, um, which, uh, which, will, which might be useful during, the, uh, during your lesson. Um, okay, so after presenting briefly High Story Lessons website, where you can find all the resources, uh, I will speak about International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, and uh, it is commemorated on 27th of uh, January, so next Friday. And this day, this is the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau uh, German Nazi concentration camp. And this day is established by the United Nations, uh, and it might be uh, an opportunity uh, to you to introduce the topic uh, to your students. So we encourage you to plan and to conduct a lesson next week um, based on the resources which we'll present you during the webinar. Uh, of course, it can be any other day. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be 27 because that, that's the day which is uh, commemorated internationally. But I'm sure that there are a lot of days uh, which might be uh, which might be useful for you, uh, for example, in your for your local community. Uh, so the four scenarios uh, I will speak about now, they are only in English. We will proceed with the translations in the future, but I'm sure that some of uh, some parts can be easily translated to your language, or you can use uh, infographics or the graphic parts from the from the from the scenarios. Um, okay, so. Uh, about the first scenario, I won't speak uh, a lot because Julia will speak about it more in a few minutes. Uh, just to just to let you know that um, that here you, in this scenario, which is called the different ways Jews were helped during the Holocaust, a student can learn what help might mean. That there were there were different ways of helping people. Uh, they can look at the medal and they can reflect on the words. Uh, who, whoever saves one life saves the world entire. Um, uh, and at the very end of the lesson, they can also reflect uh, on what do stories of helping Jews tell us about human nature in general. That's the first scenario. Uh, and the second one, it's the scenario, a scenario when students become familiar with the fate of Jewish children during the Holocaust. So especially fragile group, uh, which were affected by the Holocaust. And uh, here we speak about the story of uh, Elżbieta Ficowska, uh, who was born in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1942. Uh, and her mother, uh, when she was six months uh, old, uh, put her in the wooden box and um, and she was taken by, uh, by some people to the Aryan side. Uh, both of the parents of the girl uh, died during the Holocaust, uh, but in the box with a girl, there, was, uh, it also, uh, there were also a spoon. Uh, the, the photo of, of the spoon, you can see uh, a copy of a sil silver spoon you can see here on the, uh, on the slide. And on the spoon, it's written Erzunia, so little Elżbieta, and the date of her birth, so 5th of uh, January 1942. Um, and the girl has been adopted by a midwife, Stanisława Busold, uh, who, uh, who was awarded uh, the Medal of Racious Among the Nations. And uh, here in this uh, scenario, we use the photo of the spoon 
as a starting point uh, to, to tell her story. And uh, in, this, uh, in this scenario, students, they watch an in interview with Elżbieta Fisowska, and then they fill the questionnaire uh, as researcher and historians do. Uh, the third scenario, it's, uh, it's a bit different. It's, uh, it's an essay written by Dominika Majuk, our collaborator from Grodzka Gate in Lublin, Poland. Uh, and here she presented years of her experience in organizing events uh, about uh, commem commemorating the history of Holocaust. Um, you, can, you can read the quote, which is here, uh, of Tomasz Pietrasiewicz, who is the director of Grodzka Gate. And he said that uh, the simplest way to keep this event alive is to talk about them in different ways. Anyone who decides to tell a story using a form of their own choosing makes that story come alive and they become its custodian. So it's uh, so he's become a guard of uh, of this story. In a sense, a symbolic act of adopting memory is then performed. In this way, this adopted story is not forgotten. So that's why organizing different events in different form might be very, Im very important in, uh, in education about the Holocaust. Um, so if you're planning not only, only organize a lesson, but maybe a commemoration event, I encourage you to, to read uh, this essay. Um, and I will move to the fourth scenar scenario which is called commemorating the Holocaust in Europe. And uh, this scenario speaks about memory places in Europe. Um, and by this, we would like to draw students' attention to the fact that the memory places, it's not only a monument, but it uh, can work in very different forms. It might be a space, it might be a park, it might be a forgotten cemetery or another place. So, um, so we invite them to, to look for those places around them in their local communities. Uh, and here on the left, you can see a worksheet from uh, the scenario, uh, which is a puzzle. So the teacher is cutting out the cutting the paper and giving uh, giving to the students as a puzzle. So they need to find the name of the place, type of the place, a little description, and a photo. Uh, and then we are presenting uh, four different uh, memory places uh, in Europe: in Prague, Budapest, Berlin, and Warsaw. And students they are reflecting on how people should behave in such memory site then uh, behavior uh, depends on the type of the memory place we are uh, we are participating in we are visiting and what emotions can one experience in this kind of place uh, without dividing emotion into bad ones or good ones but just to um, having in mind that uh, a lot of different emotions can appear during such a visit um, and here on the left, on the right, it's Torpersteiner. You can read about this example in the in the scenario. Uh, so just two last slides I would like to speak about because those are four scenarios. The, the the four scenarios I would like to encourage you to use during the following days. But we've got um, a bit of different uh, other resources about the Holocaust as well, and one is uh, especially uh, up to date because uh, it's. Um, it's the project, it's a map, which we produced with uh, House of the Vanza conference. Uh, and uh, tomorrow is 20th of January, so the anniversary of signing of, of the Vanza conference, which, uh, which happened in 94, uh, 1942, during which uh, um, Eichmann uh, produced a, um, a protocol in which he described the Europe uh, and the number of Jews still living at the given territories. So this map shows us um, uh, Europe according to Eichmann. So you can, it's interactive, so you can uh, click on the territory and check how many Jews were included into the list and how, how uh, yeah, yeah, so this, that's the map. Uh, that's how maybe I will skip and the, the, the last um, 
uh, thing. It's the Memento movie. So this is just a very short 30 seconds animation, which is produced by the Hungarian artist. Uh, and it might be also a good starting point to show to the students uh, the faith of, uh, of forgotten uh, Jewish, um, Jewish citizens. Uh, okay, that that uh, that's from my side, and I will give floor uh, to Julia. Um, Julia, could you present yourself again? Because I don't know if I pronounced Bundes Real Gymnasium properly. So uh, sure. <laughs> Thank you, Ursula. You did. You did a great job in pronouncing the name. Uh, thanks, Ursula, for the material you've presented and the whole team of the European Network of Remembrance and Solidarity. Um, as I've been introduced before, my name is uh, Julia Meyer. I'm an Austrian teacher. I'm a network coordinator for Einan.at in Upper Austria. I will talk about that a bit later. And I've tried some of the material you've just seen for the European Network of Remembrance and Solidarity, and I'd like to share my experiences while doing so. I'm going to share my screen now with you. All right, done in a second. All right. Um, as good. I said before, thank you. Um, I'm a teacher in Austria. I've worked with the European Network of Remembrance and Solidarity before. Um, basically, I've been part of uh, the Sound in the Silence project of uh, the last year's project, which took part, one of them, in Mauthausen and Gusen. And I took part with uh, some of my students, who the teacher taking part in it, and I was really glad to take part, actually. It was a fantastic project. Um, I'm also glad that we could uh, continue working on this and uh, to be part of the webinar. In the next uh, roughly 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about um, one specific material you get for free on the High Story Lessons website, which is the different ways Jews were helped during Holocaust, the lesson scenario, which I've tried uh, the last week. And additionally, I'd like to share my ideas on how to prepare students when talking about the Holocaust Torah and what also could do what we could also do as teachers as a follow up activity. So I'm going to talk for roughly 30 minutes in case you have any questions you any comments, I think you are encouraged to share in the chat section. Um, additionally, you could also write them down and at the end of the presentation you are kindly asked to share them with me. In the 30 minutes i'd like to present myself briefly to you, uh, this is why you find my name on this slide. Then I'm going to talk about the school I'm working at uh, and the students I've dealt with and I've tried the material with. As a next step, I'm going to talk about the material I've tried, the different ways Jews were helped during the Holocaust. I'm going to specifically talk about preparing students to discuss the topic of the Holocaust and I'm going to talk about follow up activities, what we could do as a next step. All right, um, the next slide you see is basically about myself and about school. Um, this is um, a, a resource I've tried with students before. I make them simply guess um, what all the things they see on the slide have to do with me. You could try it yourself, just put some pictures, put some dates, whatever makes you happy on the slide and share that with your students. Um, I'd like to share normally the students guess, uh, but since we can't have interaction here, and speaking, I'm going to simply tell you the colored photo you see is the school I'm working with and where I tried the material. Um, it's called a Bundesreal Gymnasium in Enns in Upper Austria. Enns is the city it is located at. It's a grammar school for roughly 700 students. Um, the students are between 10 and 18 years old. Um, yes, I've done, I've tried the material with 15 year olds who have history lessons, lessons in English. So they are basically fluent and they have all been to different memorial sites since uh, the memorial of the concentration camp Mauthausen and Gusen are rather close by to school. So it's like a 20 minute bus ride for us. This is why we have been there, all of us. Uh, the black and white photo I'm going to talk about next has something to do with me as a person um, and my approach to history. 
It is a photo, an aerial photography that was taken during National Socialism. And it basically shows uh, the concentration camp Gusen when it was still existing. So in the early 40s. Um, I show you this aerial photo on this slide because um, the concentration camp Gusen was located in the town of Langenstein in Upper Austria. And this is the town where I grew up. So my earliest contact with the topic of Holocaust, Shoah, of concentration camps, of memorials is quite an early one since it is my hometown. Um, I didn't grow up is precisely on this area, but in the town, so not far away from where the concentration camps were. <clears throat> Excuse me. The date you see, the year 1990, is the year I was born in. Basically, that's my age. Um, and the icon that tells you are in at is where I work as a regional coordinator for Upper Austria, a network coordinator. The, it's uh, part of the URD, which is the agency of the Republic of Austria for education and internationalization. And what we do is uh, we have a program for teaching and learning about national socialism and Holocaust. Yeah, that was a short introduction to myself. This is uh, the material, it's a screenshot of the material I have used uh, with my students. It's about the different ways Jews were helped during the Holocaust. Why have I chosen this material actually? Among many, many materials you find on the High Story Lessons website. Um, I think it's a topic we don't deal with that often in Austria. And uh, I basically wanted to give students a bit of a different perspective. They've been to different memorial sites. We've uh, spoken about perpetrators a lot. We've spoken about memorials a lot. Uh, but now I think it was also time to talk about the different ways people were helped, Jewish people were helped in the times of the Holocaust. Um, this lesson scenario focuses basically on the righteous among the nations. We've pretty much heard about it a bit before, but I'm gonna focus a bit more later on in my presentation. Um, it is about individual decisions taken by Jews and those helping them. So people uh, voluntarily without getting monetary reward for it, helping Jewish people uh, to survive, helping people by providing fake papers, uh, new identities to them, by giving them food, by giving them shelter and many, many more forms of um, helping. Uh, additionally, the students become familiar with different ways Jewish people were helped during the Holocaust. So individual help, collective help, but also institutional help. Um, another reason among many, many others that makes this mid material actually a, a good one for lessons I'm, I'm planning is that it also raises the question of responsibility and how people could have um, behaved in times of national socialism kind of a range of how they could have acted with um, Jewish people, how they could have helped or not. And this is what we, what we should discuss a lot. All right, now you see them. You see the students I've tried the material with. Um, they are 15 year olds um, attending a grammar school. And this is a Monday morning lesson that starts at 7.35. So um, what I wanted to do in this lesson is I wanted basically to make them move uh, and get them not just mentally involved, but also physically a bit involved into this um, interaction topic I'm going to introduce. So what I did is I um, introduced the topic by simply asking them what they know about something. And I told them that there is a very invisible scale in our classroom and uh, they should position themselves on this uh, scale according to what they know, what they've heard of, what they've watched, read about the specific topic. Um, and I think I told them that if they stand close to the window, that's like, I've heard a lot about it. I think I know a lot about it. Um, I can share uh, closer to the wall to the left means I haven't heard about it. I'm not familiar with it. And then I've basically presented uh, terms, for example, I've presented the terms Holocaust Shoah and they positioned themselves on this invisible scale. And then they exchanged ideas with people standing close by, but also with me in case they wanted to. Um, I've also shown them the dates, January the 27th, uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, without telling him, them. I simply wanted them to, uh, to basically share what they know about it. Um, basically, they haven't heard about it before. 
Um, I also included some images, um, historic ones, for example, of uh, the concentration camp Birkenau. They might know uh, the entrance uh, to the concentration camp, to the extermination camp. This is what they have known. But I also included some um, today's Austrian perspective to it. The aim of this was, of course, to activate them a bit in the morning, but also to make them exchange ideas in peer groups. So not, not basically to always talk with the teacher about it, but to share with the people the same age. And then I've also asked them what they know about the righteous among the nation's honor, um, and they have never heard about it. And this then led me to the next step, um, where I simply basically went back one step and um, worked a bit on terminology. And they brainstormed with them, what does it mean to be a righteous person? And I did that in an online tool, I used Mentimeter for it, and they simply could uh, note down all the associations they had with this terminology. And this is just some of them. Being among others, being selfless, having a strong mind, treat people with kindness, uh, but they had many, many more uh, associations. Um, in case you don't have any um, phones, computers, whatever in class, you could also do that on the blackboard. Simply write it down on the blackboard and ask them on a whiteboard to share their associations. And then I told them um, a bit of a historical perspective, where does uh, the righteous among the nations of the world come from, that it's a Talmudic uh, phrase, that it's an official title awarded by Yad Vashem on the behalf of the State of Israel um, and the Jewish people to non-Jews who risk basically their lives also to help and save Jews during the Holocaust for altruistic reasons and how you can become a righteous among the nations. This is what I've provided that then for them. Then we went on and you get all this material for free on the High Story Lessons website. And uh, this is a source A, a list basically with uh, numbers that tells how many righteous among the nations um, were awarded to people from different countries. And what I did is I simply told them, you see the students in the background actually, to summarize the information they have, but also to ask questions. What does this source not tell us actually? And of course, it doesn't tell us the stories of people. It doesn't tell us why they were awarded that. It doesn't tell us why there is so many, whereas in other countries there's only a few. So it doesn't give us the whole picture. And this was important to me as well, to give them the ability to ask questions. We also tried to find some reasons to identify, of course, for them, Austria had a main priority. Um, what we could do also is, um, and there is some web, there is some uh, material on by the European Network of Remembrance and Solidarity. There is an overview on some countries and the role they played during National Socialism. But since I didn't have that for Austria, we simply collected, um, we did some brainstorming together, and they know quite a lot about it by now. But what we realized when they asked the questions um, is, of course, that we have a bit of a gap and that all these numbers are, of course, anonymous. They don't tell us the fate, the history of uh, the people. And then we went one step further. We, um, I used uh, the source between life and death, stories of rescues during the Holocaust. And I've put the students into different groups of four or five, and all of them got very, one very short story of uh, a righteous among the nations, um, honored person who uh, helped uh, Jewish people survive in National Socialism. What they did is they got this uh, little story as an individual. They got this story of an individual. And I asked them to find five words to summarize the story. Five words they think they need later on to present it to the peers. I also asked them to uh, define if it was individual, collective, or institutional help. So individual help, a one-on-one -on -one help situation, collective work where there is a resistance group behind, for example, partisans, or institutional help by the Red Cross, for example. We talked about that before, and uh, they knew about it. As a next step, uh, they um, got together in their teams and they shared uh, the stories with one another. So they basically used the five words and talked about it. 
um, they also tried to identify which kind of word it, uh, which kind of help it was individual aid, collective aid, or institutional aid, and I then wanted to make sure that they could have um, talk about a list of things that individuals, collective, or uh, institutions did to um, help Jewish people, and they simply had a collection then of how it was done, and they got to know different stories. Of course, I thought about about diversity as well. I included uh, men, women, elderly institutions. So I tried to find different examples of it. Mm -hmm. um, the vibe in the classroom, the atmosphere was quite a positive one, actually, when we talked about this, because it was all stories of courage. It was stories of survival. It was stories of bravery. And this actually made them really lively, interactive. I also heard them actually uh, some smiling to one another, so we could feel uh, they felt really positive about this. Um, as a next one, we had a look at um, the Righteous Among the Nations medal that is honored to these um, people. And um, there is a phrase, a quotation from the Talmud on it that says, whoever saves one life saves the world entire. And I told them uh, that they should interpret. They should interpret what this could mean uh, to them now, what it meant in the past. And they came up with very different, actually, um, ideas on what it meant. To them, in their interpretation, it could mean that uh, some people did like, um, for them, um, easily organized things. They dropped some food somewhere repeatedly, for example. Um, but for other people, it meant the world. So it saved uh, the world, whereas for others, it might not have. Um, it also told them that, um, that whatever these people did, it had a chain reaction of very positive reactions, meaning that because of the survival of one person, there is a chain reaction of positive things, a chain reaction of families, branches of family going on of positive things in life. Um, so they had the very own interpretations as as 15 year olds uh, to this quotation and then um, there is also an um in a material on the website that has some questions about how um who could make this actually relevant for today's world and the question is that i'll share it with them what can we learn from the attitudes in the context of present times? And that is also something everybody can basically relate to in, in one way or another. Um, why is it important to cultivate the memory of people who helped the Jews? Um, why is it important to share their identities, to share their stories? Um, and I also ask them to um, basically describe how how did it make a difference and i said yeah it made a difference for individuals it made a difference for whole families but it also made a difference for humanity I said wow okay and then they basically elaborated on the fact that this actually is proof that um there was humanity that people behaved differently that people um awarded assistance aid helped and also risked their lives for others and this was then the starting point when we tried to find out okay um do we have that today? Do you know a person who makes a difference for humanity now? Who would you identify as that? Um, who makes a difference today for humanity? Um, and this was not about, um, of course, putting that on the same level. That's not possible. We are talking about national socialism and today's world. But this was about making it relevant today to them now and what they know about it and how they feel about making a difference. We also went back a step to the brainstorming. They started initially where they used heroic, where they used being selfless, where they used uh, kindness, um, helping others. And I said, who would you kind of award these positive adjectives nowadays to? And then they tried to find examples. And they found many, many different ones. They did some research on personality that make a difference for them in terms of humanity, that are heroic, brave, that speak up for others, for example. And um, I basically told them that um, in the next lesson, do some research, um, find biographies, take some notes on it. And in the next lesson, I want you to have a little exhibition and share that with your peers. And they came up with very different forms. Um, of course, I told them you can write, you can draw, you can speak, whatever makes you happy. 
Um, one of them, for example, wrote about the, what's the top, that's the graphic, uh, co the comic strip you have here. And uh, she wrote about uh, Masi Alinajat. She is an Iranian-American journalist who migrated to the US uh, and speaks up for human rights, speaks up for the rights of women. And she basically turned her biography into a very, very short comic strip that, and so she shared the story of this woman, this very brave woman, with her colleagues in class. Uh, the one at the bottom left is actually a poem about uh, Malala, who uh, is a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, um, who uh, speaks up, of course, for education as well, a female uh, perspective, Pakistani, and she wrote a poem about um, her, Malala and her role. The one in the middle, the greenish one, uh, is, some people might know it by now, it's about Greta Thunberg and how she makes uh, a difference for humanity and how she speaks up um, for uh, a young, young generation to have a good future and speaks up against climate uh, change and the catastrophe that might follow. And then they've shared this with um, their peers and have also related that to the uh, adjectives they've used before to talk about the people and this made it really relevant for them today as well. All right, um, then I thought what else could I share with all the people who are now um, part of this webinar where we could talk about uh, Holocaust Shoah. And uh, this is some material um, that we have at the erinnern.at website, it's in German Vielfalt Jüdisches Leben, uh, it's like diversity of Jewish life, Jewish life before the Shoah. And Actually, um, I think it's very essential, um, not just from an Austrian perspective, but globally, to show Jewish people, to show Jewish um, identities before the Holocaust, before the Shoah, to give them a name, to give them a face, to show uh, that Jewish people are and were part of Austrian society, of societies all over the world here. Um, and this is material you get for free as well, or you could try yourself and make yourself actually. It's um, you don't tell students what they're going to expect. You simply share photos with them and the photos we have here um, all have something in common and you don't tell the students. You simply put them on the wall, you put them on the floor and you make them guess. Um, what do all these uh, photos, the people on the photos have in common? And they find different, you know, they find different uh, ideas. Um, well, and sooner or later they might find out or not that all of them are Jewish. Um, <clears throat> I've tried that before. It works excellently with students. It might also work against the stereotype, you know, that uh, one could identify from the appearance if somebody is Jewish or not. Um, and this is a stereotype you could then actually work on. Um, some didn't find that they're Jewish. Some found it uh, rather quickly because they found the Orthodox Jewish uh, and then they got the conclusion, oh, they might all be Jewish. Um, as a next step, uh, they are currently asked to um, share their ideas, of course, what do they all have in common, and then to uh, name some adjectives, how would they describe it. So are they very sporty? There is a list of adjectives you could provide for them, but you could also make them do that uh, themselves. So, um, for example, they're sporty, are they creative, um, are they traditional? Um, something like that. But also these adjectives show, not just the photos themselves, how diverse Jewish life is, how diverse Jewish life was. Um, as a next step, you could ask them to choose a picture and uh, do some research on it, for example, or choose a picture and talk about it more specifically. So um, to find out who we find, but we have here also provided some titles for the photos given, so you could also ask them to match that. And as a final step, um, when we've talked about this diverse Jewish life, this diverse Jewish life before the Holocaust, before the Shoah, um, one should also discuss or can discuss um, why the Nas National Socialists tried to make the Jewish people all the same. Why did they try to kill this diversity to kind of make it extinct? and which difference did that make? And which consequences did it have now on the long run, but also, of course, uh, during the times of the Holocaust, Shoah to the Jewish people. And this works excellently. 
with the students because kind of they get this from diversity to making them all the same why um yeah and then um as a next step one could talk about how there was jewish people's language today how there was um it is nowadays and what it can mean there is a little fact sheet we have about um what it means to be jewish jewish identities basically i also wanted to show you the following which is actually a follow-up activity I tried at school in a different context. Um, those of you who speak German, you might identify the phrase hinschauen, which means uh, in English basically look at something, look at it, face it. Um, this idea came up when um, I tried as a teacher to do a project at the Matthausen Memorial, which we then couldn't because of the corona pandemic. And it's based on an idea by the pedagogical staff, basically there in an interaction. Um, at school, we had an exhibition about the death marches um, towards the end of the concentration camps yeah, before the liberation uh, in uh, yeah, April, May uh, 1945. And there is, you can see the exhibition actually behind the girls in the back. It was just these roll-ups we had. Um, they were asked to go through it, to have a look at it, to, to do some research. And uh, then I'm a big fan of making them participate in some way. And this is what they did then. Um, they could get a stone and write down something they think people should have a look at now, people should face, people should speak up for. Because, you know, in these death marches, there was also this controversy that people haven't seen before, that they were not aware. And we actually try to get that also into the present world or the present days and make people look at something. What do we not look at? What do we ignore? What should we basically face? What should we um, have a look at? And the students could get a stone and create the stone. Some drew something, they colored the stone themselves, um, some wrote something on it, and then they placed it to a huge hinchon, which means uh, look at it. And you could see that basically from different angles in the school building. And what they wrote down is, of course, what young people today um, are confronted with. They wrote down racism, hatred against women, uh, climate change, but also anti-Semitism. Um, so they wrote down basically lots of things they are confronted with, they want to deal with, uh, and they could have a means of sharing that. And we left that for some from weeks, actually, in the school building. Another activity I want to share with you um, is the following. It's uh, about preparing students or a follow-up activity. It can be both when uh, visiting a memorial sites because our students always kind of have some expectations. They bring something before going to these places. They might have heard of it. And this is something that is not necessarily um, associated to knowledge, it's about uh, the emotions they're dealing with before and after. It's material that was designed by Maria Eka Angerer, and uh, it's material, if you visit the Memorial and Museum of the concentration camps Auschwitz and Birkenau, and uh, she designed the following. Um, she came up with a list of emotions uh, that students should circle or add themselves. The German ones you find is like scary, angsty, is that, or inspired, um, I'm, I'm, I'm worried, I'm scared, I'm a bit sad. It could also be that I don't care. So all the different emotions students might actually bring to these places. And then they're asked to uh, circle them and to add some emotions themselves they might take. Um, as a next step, one could also ask them, um, how do you deal with if something is very emotionally burdensome for you at home? How do you deal with it? How kind of how did you get some ease with it? What did you do? And by simply pointing that out, people uh, might realize what they can do in emotional, very difficult situations and they can't handle it. Which strategies do they actually have already? How to deal with these situations? Um, as a follow up. Uh, she also designed a second part of emotions that uh, one could use then as a follow-up activity. So in how far did that change? Uh, how far did your emotion change? Do you want to add something else? Let's talk about it. Of course, um, when, when we shouldn't force the students to talk about it, 
Um, if they want to share, they can share. If they want to share with peers, they can, of course. But forcing them sharing emotions might not be uh, the right thing here. I also wrote down that it might be useful to have a buddy or friend system, especially if you spend several days at memorial sites, for example, so that they know they always have somebody to stand by their side. If they can't talk to a teacher, uh, they might want to talk to a person the same age to share the emotions with them. And to know beforehand that you have somebody who is there for you um, might be actually a relief for them so that they know they are never alone. Um, another thing, if you spend several days somewhere is of course to keep a diary uh, and they could write, they could rhyme, they could write poems, they could draw, whatever. Uh, just to keep track of how the atmosphere changed, how it might, what difference it might make for themselves, how they have changed in the course of the days. This might be especially useful when you're spending more time at memorial sites. Um, a very easy activity I've also write down is the photo uh, activity. Um, I've tried it before several times that after we've been to memorial places and the students normally take some kind of pictures there. And sometimes you can ask them, uh, take one or two or take one that you didn't bring to class. And as a follow up activity, I ask them which pictures have you um, shared? Uh, which pictures have you taken? Why have you taken it? And what do you associate it with it? What do you want to share with it? And this worked really well, actually, because it kind of it is their perspective on it and it encourages them to share something they have taken with them because they take these photos, but they also take knowledge, they take emotions, so they take a lot of things with them. Um, as a next step, and that's actually the last two activities I want to present to you is um, it's two activities. Um, that deal with um, a bit can be preparation or follow up. The first is called Lebenswege, but it's easily done in English. It's basically uh, biographies. It's 14 biographies about people who um, played a role in the concentration camp Mauthausen. So this is about deportees, but it's also about the SS. It's about bystanders and so on. Um, and in this material, you see it's like this graphic uh, novel design, basically like cartoon like, and this is what younger people tend to like to work with, of course, and uh, in this material, they are um, encouraged to choose uh, a biography and the biography always has the same color. So beige is one person and so on. And uh, then they choose it, they read through it, and then they use the drawings given to present this biography to the peers so they then click through the pictures and each picture or each painting is actually a stage of their life and they present that then to the peers this material also has some tasks for uh, students uh, to work as a group so they then have follow-up questions to discuss as a group and also questions to discuss at the memorial itself so, for example, one could ask students before visiting a memorial in Mauthausen, for example, if they could find something specific there that has to do with this person in this area, there is something, do they find that? Um, or how is that remembered there? That might be, might be doable. But one could also do it as a follow up to kind of have a bit more in depth perspective on uh, people, on biographies and not just these numbers, but identities behind. Um, the last thing you see is Neue Heimat Israel, like a new home Israel. This is what I've briefly elaborated on before when we talk when I talked about the diversity of Jewish life. Um, for students, it's interesting, but it's also essential because it was the reality that uh, people um, who migrated after 1945 found a new home in Israel, but also elsewhere. And this are, these are interviews with them and material that is done about them, that life for them after 1945 went on. Of course, millions of people, millions of Jewish people were killed in the times of National Socialism, but this focus specifically on people who survived, who migrated, and how did life go on with them. And that is extremely interesting and real for students to simply show them that it didn't stop in 1945, that people had a normal life and went back to where they were before, because they were unable to, because they didn't have family, they the, all the property was taken from them. And so this shows them that there was a life afterwards, but how was this life actually done? Did they talk about the Holocaust, didn't they? How did they remember 
interesting questions that we discussed in school is also how do these people, how do these Jewish people uh, feel towards Austria, towards the state of Austria actually um, nowadays. That is interesting for them and that makes them aware that history doesn't stop in 1945 and that there is a story after that. All right. Um, these were my 30 minutes uh, and some insights I wanted to share. Um, this is my mail address. So if you want to write me specifically afterwards, please feel free to do so. Uh, I also have a newsletter uh, in Austria and in Upper Austria. If you're interested, simply write me an email and I can provide more information for you. And now I'm kindly ask uh, Ursula to talk again um, and to hopefully have some questions for all of us. Yes. Thank you, Julia, for, for this really, really interesting presentation. Uh, it was very inspiring. I just wanted to uh, <clears throat> comment that uh, I really appreciate how you how you put um, the history of Holocaust in the context of civic education, because it is crucial for for them not to only stop in the past. We speak, of course, about the Holocaust, but to but to show some some follow ups how how it might look those emotions those feelings uh, nowadays um i just wanted to said uh, that we've got 15 minutes more so please don't quit because i know how it looks like that it's 6 p.m but we we're still uh we still have uh, 15 minutes for a q a session and uh and we're waiting for your questions you can ask them on chat or through q a uh box uh so if you've got any questions to Julia to then uh, then go on. We've got a comment from Czechia, uh, from Czech Republic, from Stanislav. Uh, then when saving Jews, uh, please don't forget about mentioning Sir Nicholas Winton. He saved over 600 Jew children from Czechoslovakia, which is, um, which is like a great story with, which can be told locally and which might be very interesting for you, your students, for everyone, but for your students especially. And on the other hand, even today, I hear some people from my country denying Holocaust. I think this is something which will be uh, present like forever. And on the No to Disinformation website, we, uh, the, this uh, tab, there is, a, um, there is an article about den denying the Holocaust, which has a really long story. And, uh, and, and during like 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, it was present uh, uh, as well. And like waiting for the comments, I just wanted to comment myself about the, the list of uh, individual countries awarded by the, uh, by the Racist Among the Nations medal you mentioned. For example, in Polish Wikipedia, it's not in alphabetic, alphabetical order, but as a ranking, <laughs> which is really, uh, which, which, um, which makes no sense because you see, you see the Poland on the very top uh, and uh, that's why we shouldn't trust numbers. Uh, it, the data, they're correct, of course, but if you put them in the ranking order, uh, it, like the interpretation is totally different because for example, for, for Denmark, there are only 22 or 24 people awarded, but Danish resistant movement asked the Ad Vashem to award them as a group, not individually. So there were a lot of more people uh, um, helping, but they just asked uh, to, do, to do it individually. And like the population of Jews on the territory of Poland before the war was huge. That's why there's also the, the bigger number. So that's why uh, it's uh, important to have it in alphabetical order, uh, not to, you know, to give grades who, who did better or best. Okay, so maybe we've got some questions. Just a second. Thank you, thank you. And really, really interesting. I've got a comment. Uh, I have done various projects with students such as daily life of Jew, me as a Jew, anti-Semitic laws, classification of camps. So that, yes, thank you for, for mentioning that, that there can be a lot of different, a lot of other different projects around that. Uh, 
I've seen the question, did we collaborate? Did we uh, like work before with Yad Vashem? Uh, I think I can speak for ENRS, uh, as far as I know, not, uh, not in the project related to High Story. But Julia, did you like work with Yad Vashem themselves before? Um, yeah, for it's actually a good project that is uh, extremely well funded. Um, for inan.at, there is for teachers, um, actually, yeah, for teachers of different schools. You could also be um, for younger student, a teacher, um, or educators, of course. We go, it's called an Israel seminar, and we go to Israel for two weeks in summer times, and we spend quite some time in Yad Vashem get to know their material, um, get to know their perspectives also, and how they deal with the topic. And they provide us with many, many useful material, but also with a whole new mindset, actually, of um, um, a new, new perspective on it. Um, yeah, inan.at um, provides that for teachers of, in Austria. But I mm -hmm. think that many, many countries actually have collaborations with Yad Vashem and their teacher training programs. Mm -hmm. And they have excellent courses there that are organized. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the meantime, I will just uh, speak uh, briefly uh, about the survey. Uh, we encourage you to fill out after the webinar, um, because as I said, the project is uh, it's founded by the EU, um, uh, by the Citizens Equality Rights and Values Program. So uh, Tatiana just pasted on chat uh, information about the survey, so there is a link um and we kindly ask you to fill it just to give us a feedback about the webinar uh and uh, if you want to fill it the survey you need the reference of the project which is the numbers here but it's on chat as well so it it, it just requires like i don't know five minutes or something to to type the reference number and to go through the survey itself so we really really appreciate you uh, filling it um and i would really love to encourage you to send us uh, some information if you will manage to conduct a lesson next week or during the following days so if you if you i know made some photos or could briefly uh, sum up what happened during the lesson in your uh, in your classroom it would be really lovely so i would just remind about it in the email uh, as julia uh, show showed i think there are like a thousand of possibilities to mix the teaching resources you can do it you can really uh, adjust them to to your needs uh, so uh, so we we really love to hear your feedback about the resources and about your ideas how to how to work them within your classrooms um, and just one thing that we've got uh, already we've Oh, oh, for now, we've got a date uh, on 13th of March. This will be our next webinar because we'll be cere celebrating this year on anniversary of Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, uh, which happened in 1943 um, and the, uh, during the action of liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So we will have a webinar on that. Uh, the presenting teaching resources about Jewish Warsaw as well. So, um, so feel invited already. Uh, and here I, I display my email if you want to contact me or get some other resources. Uh, but for sure, uh, tomorrow morning, I will send you our presentations and, uh, and links to all the teaching resources um, you are invited to use. But I'm looking on chat whether whether do you've got maybe some questions. I think I haven't mentioned it, but I spent two lessons with that with them actually. Mm -hmm. It was that was completely fine. We could deal with it in two lessons, and I think it made an Mm -hmm. um, a lasting impression on them but with this with the stones activity whether it was what do we not look at today for example um some people did that in the breaks some people just did that before going home so that was not even necessarily a lesson that was spent on it 